Um, so first up, we have, um, uh, well, this session obviously is about uh, collections online and value. So if it's not what you came here to see, then time, time to leave now. Um, but please don't. Um, so the first one is about collections of the Nelson Atkin Museum of Art, which I'm sure you can read off there. But uh, there's an interesting one about getting a large, it's a print catalogue, I think, isn't it? Um, into an online space and all the interesting uh, challenges that poses. And then we have a, a rundown of top 10 tips on gaining value from online collections from uh, going on the end there. So um, I think we can probably start, actually. Um, so not a tiny bit too early, but I think we're probably, uh, people will catch up. OK, thank you. Welcome. Last fall, so 2014, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art decided to embark on its first digitization of a legacy publication, American Paintings to 1945, the collections of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. You can go ahead and one more. Yep. Perfect. American Paintings to 1945 is the award-winning comprehensive catalog of the museum's American Paintings collection. It was initially published in print form in 2007. <coughs> the museum's plan was always to make the information in the catalogs available online in some capacity. But this was, a work, this was work that was sidetracked by the 2008 economic downturn, and there was never a clear plan in place for how this information would be formatted and made available. In 2010, the Henry Luce Foundation granted $25,000 to complete the work of making the catalog information available online as part of a larger grant to the museum's American Art Department. Last fall, a team came together to finally fulfill this objective by digitizing the catalogs. That team included myself. I'm the assistant curator of American Art at the Nelson Atkins, as well as Matt Pearson, who was then our head of imaging services and is now the head photographer at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Stacey Sherman, our senior coordinator of rights and reproductions, and we were shortly thereafter joined by Doug Allen when he came to the museum as our CIO. The group began its work by weighing options for presenting the digital catalogs, including posting the volumes to nelsonatkins.org as simple PDFs, or partnering with the Internet Archive, which would scan and host the catalogs, or some combination of the two. Ultimately, we decided to begin by partnering with the Internet Archive, as their scale and facility with this type of work presented technical and cost advantages that Matt will discuss in greater depth, in particular for a one-off digitization experiment such as this. While Matt worked with the Internet Archive to create a digital copy of the catalog with high-quality reproductions, a process he will also describe in greater detail in a moment, the team corresponded with colleagues in order to determine whether or not we would need to reobtain the rights to reproduce digitally the images that were originally published in the catalog Stacy will describe what we learned in detail shortly. After determining that we would need to reobtain the rights to reproduce the images in the catalog, we began using JIRA, a work tracking system that Stacy will also describe, to follow each of the images in the catalog through the permissions process. Ultimately, as you will hear, this project has provided an excellent opportunity for the museum to explore possible plans for a larger presentation of legacy publications while developing an understanding of the intermediary work and coordination required to complete these projects. Speaking of complete, before I hand the presentation off to Matt, I'm happy to say that as of this week, our work, our internal work on this project is complete, and the catalog should be live on Internet Archive next week. Matt? Thank you. So I won't read through all of the bullet points on the slides, but there were a few um, a few benefits that kind of swayed us toward working with the Internet Archive. Uh, for this project, it was the fact that we didn't have the resources available to host uh, an online book ourselves, uh, and that was something that they could provide for us, so it meant that we could make the project happen in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. Uh, there were some added benefits, which I'll talk about later on in the presentation, um, some ec additional services and products that IA would, would provide for us. They were amenable to working with a museum. I knew from working with them in the past that they would would be willing to work through iterations of kind of quality control and make some adjustments on their end. Cost was a big factor. 
um, as you can see, uh, the cost for them to digitize and then host, or for us to digitize in-house and have them host was pretty, pretty minimal. I mean, we're looking at about $90 total cost. Um, and that left us with a significant amount of money left over for dealing with the uh, rights management or the, you know, clearing the rights for the digital version. Uh, most importantly, though, I think was the opportunity for capacity building uh, within the museum. Uh, as Kate mentioned, Stacy will talk about in a moment, uh, we chose JIRA for kind of managing the project and all of these rights requests. Uh, not that that particular product is what, what we will end up using or the museum will end up using, but the strategies I think that we developed and the lessons learned would inform future projects. So, Stacy, you want to? Thanks, Matt. Um, so, first of all, we, um, in dealing with the rights component of the project, we first considered whether or not it was even necessary to um, obtain or clear additional permissions for the digital version. Um, and so first we consulted the ex existing agreements for the print publication. Um, and they were all very specific about what rights were given. Um, they were for a print catalog for a certain number of copies, North American distribution, et cetera. Um, and so we became concerned that that, that, that restricted us. Um, and because of the defined nature of the agreements, um, we decided to consult experts in the field to, to guide us. Um, so. um, and we got several responses. The most helpful is shown here. Um, about digital copyright, um, and it emphasizes the importance of the wording and the agreements, um, which is what I basically said earlier. Um, if you're very specific as to the rights granted, then you, um, you know, you can sign away. You, if you want to rely on fair use, then you can basically potentially sign that away um, for using that for the digital version. Um, and we also went through fair use evaluation tools. There are a lot of those out there, and those were provided by the, uh, included in the advice. Um, and there are helpful tests in those where um, you can see uh, whether the outcome after applying these tests would favor fair use or not. Um, and in this case, um, it slightly favored fair use, although we had determined that the language and the agreements uh, really uh, dictated that we wanted to obtain the additional permissions. Um, and uh, finally, also pointed out here is that um, a, de a decision as to whether to rely on fair use or not is also depends on your particular institution, how risk averse they are. Um, ours has a history of being conservative um, in the past, but we are engaging in um, more robust discussions uh, for the future as far as relying on fair use. And part of that is also the CAA Code of Best Practices that has been released um, and information in the Rights and Reproductions Handbook that's been put out by the um, AAM. So. Um, so once we decided to obtain the permissions, um, we realized it was a pretty major undertaking um, and that we would benefit from a project management tool um, to track the work. Um, and our department, Imaging Services, had already started using JIRA to track our um, new photography and rights and reproductions requests. So uh, we decided that it would be also a good tool to create a separate project and track all the um, additional permissions for this through that. Um, so, uh, also a benefit is that all the documentation, the old and the new documentation, can be input into each ticket. The digital contact information for the rights holders, uh, then and now, and uh, all of the electronic correspondence, you know, can be converted to PDF and attached, and also the new permissions attached into one ticket. And working cross departmentally th uh, on this project, that was extremely helpful. Um, it saved, you know, saved a lot of time and paper. So, um, JIRA allows you to configure every ticket uh, however you want, uh, depending on your project. So, Kate, Matt, and I all worked on 
figuring out what would be included in the ticket uh, and the, especially the status steps um, involved. And so this is a blank ticket with all the information that um, Kate actually ended up inputting um, the information for, but this is the ticket before it's populated. Um, and I'll also mention that there were 550 um, tickets to be created, <laughs> the, the images in the, so it was a big undertaking. But in the end, we felt that it was, it was really the most efficient thing for people going back um, in the future to have all of that in this uh, location, as well as um, for going through it. You get status alerts with it. You get email alerts for the, when the different steps are, are uh, completed throughout the process. There are a lot of alerts, <laughs> but uh, you know you can choose to ignore them or um, look at them later. So, um, and then we also it, it, we also realize the importance of working out those steps afterwards, um, because some of them proved redundant, and then some of them we wish we'd added in. We realized that they weren't there. So, lessons for the future. Um, so this is an example of a ticket with the information in, um, showing the status as the permission has been requested, um, and then all the information basically about the image, the reproduction. Uh, it includes the uh, website a link for the rights holder, uh, the image repository, which isn't always the same, so for each image. Um, And here, you just these are arrows pointing out to some of the different status steps. So obviously, some of these we weren't charged for using the images. So it's working out those steps. Basically, um, was part of what I was saying before. Um, but basically, like permission received, you would go through, you know, invoice received, invoice process, things like that um, are shown. And this is just the diagram of the workflow. Um, from the, of the process from the start to finish. Uh, this is just a page of open tickets, one page of the 550. <laughs> and that, I will say, the 550 included, we decided to include our images, all the images that were in the book, so that there would be, a, you know, it would be a complete record of all the reproductions. Um, and then an example of, um, uh, well, and, What's also great is, you know, JIRA allows the users to create the charts and, and graphs um, tracking the progress of the project. So this was early on, and you could see that, you know, we had a certain number resolved, the permissions have been requested, info was confirmed, and then a bunch were to do. So, um, and then actually now that's all green because <laughs> they've all been resolved. Um, which we're very happy about. And this just shows um, the export capabilities for reporting also, um, which proved helpful for reporting back to the institution about the status of the project. Um, so yeah, we were very happy with it. And it worked, worked really well for us. So. I'll turn it back to Matt to describe the actual book digitiza digitization process. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. Um, so Internet Archive uh, is a great vendor to work with, uh, but their focus or their mission, while it, there might be some synergy with the museums, doesn't overlap. Uh, their primary goal is to put textual content online, and we love our textual content and our graphic visual content representations of the artwork. So it's really important that we achieved uh, enough fidelity uh, to keep our curators happy, but at the same time to, um, to support the Internet Archive's processes of uh, optical character recognition, converting those pages of text into something that's digital, computer. Um, we knew that uh, they would be willing to work with us, uh, so we were a little bit more comfortable with them as a vendor. Uh, and as I said before, we ended up doing some of the digitization in-house as opposed to having them do it, only because uh, after a couple of iterations of back and forth, 
uh, we decided it would be much faster to provide them with a good model of something that would be acceptable to us. And we worked with curators. We bought, brought the results that they sent us back to curators, and we talked through what the expectations should be um, and kind of landed somewhere where we all felt pretty comfortable. So next slide. Um, this is just a setup. Most of us have seen this kind of thing before. It's a book, uh, you know, copy stand with an icon, a couple of strobes that you don't see off camera. Um, we took, for our digitization, we took our copies or a, a, a set of our copies of our uh, catalog and sent it off for disc binding. Um, it's a 2007 publication. We had additional copies around, so we had the luxury of being able to do that. This binding was like $12, and it enabled a book technician or a, a photographer to digitize all 800 pages within two hours. So two hours of photography and about two hours of QC was the total time for, for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, just to be a little bit more specific, we we created a little raised platform instead of a, a fence or, or something to push the pages up against so that the technician could align the pages to those edges. Uh, and they just clicked away using a foot pedal and uh, kind of watched the progress on a screen off to her left. Next slide. Um, we pointed, I think, uh, Adobe Photoshop, Lightroom, or it might have been Bridge, one of those two, uh, to like a watched folder. Um, and again, the technician checked for focus and checked for completeness. And you know, if she missed a page or if something was a little bit crooked, she could remediate right then and there, which saved us a lot of time in the end too. The same tool, the same software was used for the QC at the end of the project. Um, and this is what it looks like online. So the pages go up, reasonably good f color fidelity, not a perfect match, but something that we felt was a reasonable representation. You know, people can buy the book. Um, next slide. And one of the one of the additional benefits of Internet Archive is this full text searching capability. So the OCR optical character rec recognize the text, uh, and then make it indexed and fully searchable. So you can type in Benton, and it will highlight every instance of Benton in the catalog, and also create this nice little um, kind of timeline type thing on the bottom. Um, and then that's also available for search engines to kind of ingest and uh, give us even more exposure. Next slide. Uh, our landing page at Internet Archive, which is kind of growing and changing, they, they provided some level of reporting uh, in addition to uh, what we would put in place ourselves. Uh, and we could you know, kind of add a little bit of background information about our museum and point people back to our museum website. Uh, and then these are the two links to, which you can discover if you go to archives.org, you can find our catalog now that it's live. Uh, these are the direct links and they have a widget uh, which we can embed in our collection search pages, for example. If we wanted to include a link to the catalog or a page from the catalog um, along with the page for one of the objects in our collection. Next. Uh, and then this slide just shows the different, I know it's hard to read, but I'm hoping that our PowerPoint will be included somewhere so you can download it. Uh, it's pretty readable at that point, but uh, the different file formats that they offer for download for both the image files, you, know, you can get the whole book, you can get a page of the book, uh, along with metadata uh, in different formats. So they've got Deja Vu up there, EPUB. You can get the OCR text, just the, the textual part of it if you want to. Uh, and then mark records. So the metadata tends to be a little bit more bibliographic in nature. Um, but they're providing it, you know, they're organizing it for us. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. We do have some outtakes. Uh, uh, as I think we all mentioned, there's some lessons learned. Uh, and there's some, definitely some more we can talk about. Uh, if you could quickly just toggle through the, the last rapid fire. Um, you know, keep going. Just all the way. 
So if any of that looked of interest, I'm happy to talk, or we're happy to talk more about it, uh, either here or, um, or afterwards. Uh, you can definitely reach us, but um, you know, it was a good, a good learning experience for us, and we're looking to share some of that with everyone else. Was that, are we good on time or? Are we or? good on time? Yeah, we've got, um, we've got just over 10 minutes for questions and then before the next session, does, does anyone have any questions open to any of our uh, panel here? Ah. How did your, like, change in relationship to you and your, like, new work? Were you able to both part of you look at a project and see exactly where you are and use your next offer? So she would get a notification saying, you know, the permission has been requested for. That's why I said it's a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, but yeah, every time a step moves forward, it sends her an automatic notification. And just to back that up a little bit, even all of the um, the physical files from the 2007 Cooper volume resided with my department with American Art Curatorial, and so I was able to upload all of those digitally into Zira. So Stacy knew had a baseline to work from moving forward to, to the update that contact information for the rights holder and then contact them, secure the rights for the digital version and put all of that together in a single package so we can eventually, I think I will still, just print all of those um, as well as exporting them to PDF that we can keep digitally and have duplicate archives in case anybody ever needs to revisit this work again in the future. Or wherever it ends up living. Yeah. It, yeah. <coughs> Take a second. Um, how many of those 560 images Oh, that we didn't have to get permission yeah. for? Right, I thought about that before and I don't have those numbers, so I'm just I'm gonna wing it. Um, so there are 550, I think, and I almost. Would, I would say 160 of those were auxiliary images that um, have, that need required permission beyond our museum. Um, whether they're protected by VAGA or ARS, or they're held by a different repository. Right, so and that's a gray area. And then, right, and some of our images actually that pertains to as well. Um, they have rights issues where we, you know, obviously it depends on the, the copyright. Um, but we also, it wasn't just that all of our images were fine, some of those all we also had to clear permissions for the objects in our collection. Related to that, you mentioned uh, a fair use analysis tool or tools that you use. Were those just websites or? Uh, yeah, there are a variety of, uh, there's a Columbia, um, there uh, is one, Stanford, um, I can, those can be incorporated in here, um, if that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they can. Thanks. I, I could feel a question, if we had these files already, why did we go ahead and digitize the hard copy and put that online? Um, and I think I'm going to start to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we weren't sure about the integrity of those and how reliable they were. They weren't PDFAs, so they didn't include the original font, for example. Um, they were even broken down into sections. There were still huge PDFs to deliver. Um, and how to deliver that, you know, with just a download link on the on the website and what that would mean to kind of our bandwidth if everyone started clamoring for the catalog at once, uh, which is another reason why we thought, I mean, we put a lot of thought and discussion into why work with Internet Archive, but this just seemed like a really quick and easy way for us to accomplish a year's worth of work um, and then to reflect on it and maybe go a different route or maybe continue. Um, well, it's it's yeah. indexed, yeah. right? Um, and certainly it's linked. Like I can go to Internet Archive site and type in Nelson Atkins and find an audio interview with our Julian, our director, our catalog, and two other articles written about the museum, and they're all connected and they're all there. They're returned together. 
which is kind of neat. So different entry points to our museum or different ways of exposing it. Um, Embarking upon the project and then finishing it. Yeah, actually, in about a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the use of JIRA is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, the way I've seen this normally done is with monstrous Excel spreadsheets with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of color coded cells in, which only one person understands compared to traditional ways. How, how did you get? How did you get to choose using JIRA? And what other things did you consider along the way, and, and then put to one side? I mean, it, it feels like it kind of inspired me. Well, uh, yeah, I had I had worked with Stanford for a while, uh, where we 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 used JIRA for legitimate JIRA purposes, like software development. Um, but at Stanford, we had experimented with using JIRA for some lightweight type project management. And I was aware of some of the functionality, like you know, being able to be in inundated with status update emails and also having everything together and being able to attach documents to tickets or relate tickets to each other. It just seemed like something that might work well. And I was very, I think we were very fortunate to have, although a very conservative museum, uh, a very creative group of people. Um, so we gave it a try. Was there anybody outside your sort of the people here that had to use it as well? Was it sort of you? Uh, curatorial, which is usually Julianne and then us, yeah. but yeah, just well, we don't, it's not institution wide right now. Right. Uh, we have a certain number of seats. We actually added some, um, a few, I think, in the initial. Yeah, and we use, so the imaging department also uses it to work with um, some of the events photography is co managed uh, with the design department. And so uh, they share an account with Imaging Services. We have two coordinators, and they both get the same tickets and the, the same updates and all of that. Uh, so that's another department that uses it. But I don't think they're using it for project management or for the design work yet. <laughs> we used Jira for a while, and we, one of the reasons we stopped it with, with our content editors is because they couldn't cope with the number of um, notifications that were getting. It's sort of what, what do you think? Oh, I think they stopped it because it took a little bit. We, we never, never, never won them over on that. Yeah, we'll say, um, being the department head, uh, I would get the updates, status updates for the events photography, the collection photography, the requests in for this project. So um, I had to do a lot of email filtering. <laughs> Um, but it was good. I, I, I felt like I had my finger on the pulse, and I could answer to anyone at any time about what we were doing and where we were. Yeah. Well, we are a lot smaller than you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were only doing correspondence. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? There, there are some really neat lessons learned. I, I encourage you definitely to follow up with Kate and Stacy. Um, there's a lot of good info in there. do a bit of um, laptop juggling. Uh, well, not with my laptop. <coughs> While we do that, uh, this is Gavin, uh, Gavin from COGAP, who will be talking about the um, top 10 tips for getting value from your online collections. Uh, did you have the... Um, I've got the, the uh, little thingy. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, and I need that one as well, don't I? I will do. <laughs> cool, thank you.
Okay, so next up we have Gavin from Cognac, who will be talking about um, that. I will. <laughs> I'm just getting my last thing set up. Hello. Um, so yes, I am Gavin. I am head of production at Cogap. Um, and Cogap is a company in England, in Brighton. Uh, we've been making online collections for 30 years. So uh, um, we've done things with MoMA, with the Met, with the National Portrait Gallery, with the Whitney, uh, with the v &A. We did a jewellery, in, in jewellery interactive mm -hmm. for you guys a little while ago. So um, my presentation today is a top 10 countdown of top tips. There's a lot of topness for making amazing online collections. Um, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts about it. Don't worry about taking photographs and stuff because I've already put it on SlideShare, but don't spoil the surprise by looking on there now. Um, and I'll, I'll tweet the link to it when I'm finished. OK, so up three places to number 10. It's dialogue, not broadcast. So the future of museums, we heard this from Carol and Alyssa yesterday, the future of museums isn't lecturing people it isn't knowing everything it's about having a conversation it's about working together to learn from each other and a, a great step of doing this with your collection is to embrace not knowing everything to accept that you don't know it and be cool with that and be open about it so i've got a couple of examples of people that are doing that this is the digital museum an online collection of norwegian art and cultural history and down here in the corner, they have just lovely language. Help us. We know too little about this thing. Do you know anything about this? So it's admitting we don't know everything. We need your help. It's starting a conversation. It's really friendly. It's the sort of thing you would say to a person in real life. And then you'd sit down together and say, yeah, all right, let's see if we can work this out together. I, I think it's beautiful use of language and a, a really good example of the kind of thing I'm, I'm um, talking about. Another one, the National Port Portrait Gallery. Um, we did some work for them recently, so we did their online collection. We recently put an extra little bit on it, which was a similar kind of thing. Um, the tell us more. Okay, have you seen something that we've got wrong? <gasps> we might get something wrong? Us? The National Portrait Gallery? No, apparently. And so what, what uh, they're asking for, tell us a little bit more about this person. So we've got, a, this is my favourite of many examples, a, a lady who says, this is actually my mum. So. Everybody, everybody benefits from this, so that the gallery benefit because they get extra information that they didn't have. She tells us all these things about her, her real name and her nicknames and stuff. Julia Allen, what, that's wonderful. To find that and be able to say, put your hand up and say, that's my mum. To be able to say that and have that recognised by the gallery and recognised by the world because it all gets uh, put on, on the website. But it's also really cool for me as a user because it starts to humanise that person that is just a portrait. It starts to get me wondering about who is that person and like what, what's, uh, what our ancestors doing. So it gives a whole extra dimension to it. And um, I don't just like bang on about this. I tried to do it a little bit. So I planned this presentation by asking for help on Twitter because I don't know everything either. So um, and that, this is where I got the first example from, uh, that Norwegian museum. So by admitting that I didn't know everything, I'm actually able to give you a better presentation and then look like a smarter person than I really am. So it's kind of a <laughs> funny little paradox. Um, so all of the, there's a whole load of su uh, suggestions there from lovely people, and I've collected all of those together into a Google Doc. So again, I'll tweet the um, link to that. And please, just add as many in as you can, uh, put, put little comments and notes on there, and hopefully it'll turn into a useful resource that we can all use and benefit from. So yeah, that was number 10. Dialogue, not broadcast. Now we've got a new entry at number nine. Never, ever call your online collection a database. This is an absolute pet hate of mine. Um, ban that word, database. A database, and I might offend some people, so sorry in advance, but a database is basically a spreadsheet. It's boring, right? It's not, it's not exciting. It's about information storage or organising stuff or retrieving information. It's a thing that drives your online collection. It's the sit thing that sits behind it. But... The online collection has to be more than just storage or retrieval. Your online collection is an exploration aid. It's an inspiration creator. It's a connection maker. It, you can call it whatever you like, just don't call it a database. It's a, it's a thing that inspires people to come to your museum. It's not a database. OK, I'm going to oh, stay calm. OK, up five places at number eight. It's know who and why. So, this sounds obvious. You have to know 
who you're doing this for, who you're do making this online collection for, and why you're doing it. And if you can't answer that in one sentence, then you need to stop and you need to figure it out. And like, don't be fooled, this isn't easy. I was talking to Jane from Cleveland yesterday about the difficult decisions that you have to make, choosing which audiences to serve and which ones not to serve, either so well or perhaps even at all, because you can't serve everybody effectively. It's a tough call, um, but it can be done, and you need to do that. If you want your online collection to be successful for you, your users, and your organisation, you just have to know what it's there for, what it's trying to achieve, and then you can figure it out. And that helps you with a new entry at number seven, don't just measure, act. So everyone has Google Analytics, right? Some people even look at the Google Analytics every now and again. But it's only worth looking at, having them and looking at them if then you do something. You have to react to your analytics. And it sounds really obvious, but in my experience, not everybody does this. So you can look at your analytics. You can look at what the terms that people are searching for. Um, maybe that means you should start changing the language that you're using to describe things if, you're, if it doesn't match up. Um, uh, John Tiff from the Science Museum. Science Museum uh, had a little while ago, a, they spotted a spike in, uh, for, on one of the objects, a kind of weird mechanical hand thing. It's a little bit spooky and creepy, so I haven't put a picture of it on here. But they saw the stats go through the roof and put the effort into figuring out what's just happened. And it turned out that someone had nicked the image and put it on a, a steampunk blog that had then gone viral. Everyone got really excited about it. And so the museum were then able to leverage that and start talking about it themselves, entering that conversation, and become part of it, rather than it just happen and them, them never know about it. And that all came from not just measuring, but acting. But this is difficult. It takes time. You need to allow yourself the time and the space to do it, in, and the headspace. It it's, takes a long time to get into to figure out like what's just happened, what might that mean, what should we do about it, and then do the thing, and then check if the thing that you did really worked. But once you get into that kind of rolling system of measuring, acting, measuring, acting, it, it, it's really useful, really helpful, it's better for everybody. If you just have Google Analytics, or you just have it and then look at it sometimes, it's, it's a waste of time, it's the, the impact is zero. Okay. Up five places to number six, it's find the fun. So uh, Shri from the Met, uh, he said that museums aren't competing with each other, they're competing with Netflix and Candy Crush. And he's right, but museums can be fun too. And he was making that point, I'm not saying that he wasn't. So uh, museums are officially fun, and I've got a quote that proves it. So this is from the New York Times. Uh, this is someone talking about the Whitney's on online collection that, um, that we, we worked on earlier this year, and we took their online collection from 700 objects that were all managed in a CMS to 21,000 objects, which was coming out of their, um, their database. And, and that's where the fun comes from in this, in that you can see everything, all the stuff that you can't see on the walls. You can start making connections yourself and giving the user access so that they can explore things through the collection. But there's other ways of having fun. So a couple of examples. The table, which you can shake and gives you random artwork, and it's fun, and it, it starts to engage you in a different way. Or even MoMA's 404 page, I love this. It's using a collection object as their error page. It's really cool. <laughs> Just using your collection in new, interesting ways, and then we can find the fun in what we've got, and that will help us stick it to Netflix. <laughs> yeah. And is it just me, or when you look at this, do you always see... SF MoMA's art scope. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that is just me. OK, so number six, find the fun. We've got a non-mover at number five. It's join the dots. Help your audience, your fans, your users, to join the dots. Tell them the stories of your collection by helping them make connections, enrich their journey. Now, these are all big words that are kind of meaningless, if it, unless I have an example. But I've got an example, so it's OK. So this is the Baseball Hall of Fame. And what this does is uses collection objects to start to tell the story. So this is a <laughs> Mr. Killebrew from Minnesota. So these are his stats. And then down here, we've got the, the bat that he used to score his 500th career home run. So this telling the story, it's not just here's a bat that some guy used to hit 500 home runs. It's got, you've got the whole thing. And that, then you can go from here into the bat and get all the information about the bat. Or it's kind of, it, it guides you through. And you can take the journey that you want to take 
but it's got all the information there. It's helpful, it's holding your hand. That's joining the dots. Now we've got a new entry at number four. Recognize the blend of skills to make this awesome. So when you're making an online collection, you need a bunch of skills, and we've probably got most of them in this room somewhere. You need technical skills, you need content skills, you need curatorial skills, user experience, design, accessibility, digitization, project management, budget management, all of that stuff. And hey, you've probably got to do your, do your day job as well, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have collaboration, you have to have teamwork, but you also need an empowered owner and decision maker for the project. Someone who's responsible for making it succeed, someone who's going to drive it through, make it happen. The person that gets the big pat on the back at the end or the big kick up the ass if it goes wrong. Someone that really takes responsibility and also someone that knows that they don't know everything and so they bring in people that know the stuff. They bring in people to collaborate with. And you don't just stop that collaboration, that talking, that thinking, that driving it forwards on the day that you launch. So um, my... Uh, Friends at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, they've just started having an online collections meeting. Every, it's either every two weeks or every four weeks, but the point is they're getting together to keep on top of it, to talk about it, to come up with new ideas, to say what's next, not just, oh, we've done it now, let's move on to the next thing. You've got to keep, it's like a garden. If you don't go and trim it occasionally and think about it, it'll all get overgrown and horrible. Up seven places to number three, it's deliver experience over data. We've heard some stuff yesterday. Don't just recreate the physical experience online. That's lazy, and it won't give the best result for you or for your users. This is an online experience. It's not an in-gallery experience. So we have to remember that when we're, we're creating online collections. And also, just because you've got the data, it doesn't mean it's useful to the audience. So things like provenance, accession numbers, exhibition history, all that stuff, it can be useful but you have to work it. If you just chuck it all up there, it's too much. It's for the, for the, the majority of people in the majority of institutions, that's not the stuff. So the experience is the object. Start with the art and everything else, do we really need it? A non-mover at number two, always do something new. That is beautifully bright, isn't it? It's nice. Um, so all of us do online collections, well, or, or I expect we do. And if we all just do the same old thing, if we all just like look at this online collection, recreate that, nothing will ever move forwards. But if all of us, all of us promise right here, right now, to try one little innovation every time we do something, then think how far we could move the dial. If we just push it a little bit, each of us, every time, working together, how we can make online collections really, really exciting. So be adventurous, push yourselves a bit. And some people are doing this already. So. Um, this is Artbinder's Colour Viewer, which is a new way of looking at, um, it's a pretty new way of, of looking at artworks. So I can find artworks that are that, exactly that green and pink that we were just uh, getting excited about, and they really do look beautiful on this projector. And then look at, don't just look at other museums collections, look outside of that. So this is Artsy, and Artsy sell art. Oh, the in dignity of it but they do but you know they're making money out of this stuff so you know that they're looking at what works and what doesn't so there'll be some stuff in there that we can all learn from so let's have a look at it um i'd love to see a museum put their entire collection on instagram somehow linking through to the more detailed information and and re-leveraging that to drive people to the site to to learn more about it um, and there's a, a talk that maybe relates to this tomorrow so if you think that too, then find that and check it out. And this is the, this is the Mallory Gallery. These are pictures that my children drew. Um, <laughs> so yeah, do, do something new. There's um, smaller collections or sub-collections uh, have opportunities to go deep, not broad, and maybe do something a little bit more interesting and in innovative. Um, so yes, anyway, that's number two. All right, now, this is uh, the bit where I'm going to plug my phone in. Um, it's also the bit that's probably going to be the best bit of the presentation. So if you want to video it or um, get your phones ready, <laughs> this is... Oh, it's all gone a bit wrong. Okay. Turn the volume up. Okay. So, <laughs> let's do a, a recap, top of the pop style, of all of the ten things. 
Oh, hang on. I'm just keeping you waiting. Okay. A number 10, it's dialogue, not broadcast. A non-mover at nine, it's never ever a call your online collection a database. And up three places at eight, it's know who you who and why. All right, pop pickers? Not half. <laughs> non-mover at number seven, it's don't just measure, act. Up three at six, find the fun. A new entry at five, join the dots. In at four, recognize the blender skills to make this awesome. And up two at three, deliver experience over data. In at two, always do something new. And coming up, it's the top of the chart, it's... Shout about it! <laughs> so when you, when you do your online collection, tell everybody. Make a big deal out of it. You've just done something brilliant. So here's the Whitney's online collection. I talked about it a little bit earlier. 700 items to 21,000 items overnight. Stuff available online for the first time ever. That's brilliant. So shout about it. They did. Here's an article, that, uh, another article in the New York Times that also featured the Met, Tate, MoMA, and others. So getting the word out and doing it together. Like together, our voices are more powerful, more interesting. Um, this is a, another site that we worked on, the Qatar Digital Library, uh, with the Qatar National Library and the British Library. They actually employed a PR agency to shout about this for them. That was a smart move, because they got on the... This is a Guardian article, which was really nice. They were on the BBC, on TV, and on, on their website, in the Times newspaper, in loads of, loads of newspapers, loads of Gulf-based media coverage. And the stats in the first week were insane. They went through the roof completely driven by media. And we still get stuff, we, we see spikes and we can very easily directly relate that back to either something in print media or something that, that um, in online media. So it, it really, really works. So that was number one, shout about it. And don't just shout about it out there, shout about it internally. Tell your colleagues, tell your boss, tell your whole company, do a town hall, send an email to the whole company because you've done something awesome when you've done an online collection. So well done, you. Um, that's the end from me. Thanks very much. So I'll tweet the, uh, the online collection resources, and I'll tweet the slide deck in a little bit. Um, and please do retweet it for anyone that missed the session. All right. All right. Thank you. Oh, that was fabulous. Do you want to stay at the podium for uh, questions in case anyone has okay. any? Yeah. Do we have any questions for Gary? <coughs> Hello. Yeah, how do you uh, balance like, expectations about what should always be you know, creative and important terms of with a person who's like doing something new? Like, do you do like three things that are standard and then always something new? Or do you think you should be doing more you know, new stuff, like more innovative stuff? I think you should push it wherever you can. So you need to do the core stuff. But if you can agree with yourself, first of all, to always try something different. So I've never, like, I've never done a presentation where I <laughs> did a chart run down to music. I was trying something new. I was pushing myself a little bit. And we should all do that in all bits of our work. So I think wherever you can, take advantage of the ability to push it or to innovate. But don't, not, not at the expense of the important core stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'll tweet the music as well, yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you have to use them for fair use. <laughs> it's on YouTube, it must be okay. Yeah, yeah right, oh, that's cool. That's okay. You got to see who's it here first. Okay. Cool. All right, thanks, everybody. Okay, good.